I'm very happy to be here and very glad that I can be here with my son, Primo, 10 years old, who is playing uh, on his uh, iPad somewhere in the back. As a single parent, it's always important uh, when we get invited to something that when the hosting organization is prepared to facilitate traveling with the child. And because the summer holidays uh, have already started in Sweden, um, he needed to come along with so thank you for that, and thank you, Carla, for the wonderful, uh, smooth, uh, practical organization. So imagine a structure that simultaneously resembles a spaceship and a memorial. It has just landed in a former storage space underneath a modest shopping mall in the late modernist suburb of Stockholm, a part of Sweden's nationwide million dwelling program, which was running between 1960 and 1974. The structure is gray and angular, but changes its skin constantly since video projectors shower it with abstracted images of rectilinear spaces, darkness dotted with stars, and words set in black and white against a bright pink background. The latter is this, recognizable as what? Hello, you British. Black <laughs> <Sex> crystals. <laughs> exactly. Never <laughs> mind, <laughs> Exactly. The first album of the Six Pistols. <laughs> Suddenly, there is footage from a very similar structure set in a green park surrounded by blue sky. Just as with the spaceship ruin in the former storage space, you can enter the film structure, and in the structure, in the green park, you can even climb stairs to reach its top floor. <laughs> Artists Thomas Enoch Songs and Peter Schwing's science fiction inspired model Time, Space, Shuttle, a polo pavilion in brackets, is a reworked version of the painter Victor Passmore's abstract sculpture, The Apollo Pavilion. Um, from 1969 uh, or 70, you get different dates when you Google it, which is located in the middle of a housing area in Pichelli. And Pichelli, of course, being a small mining community <coughs> south of Newcastle. And it was, as many of you know, part of the British Newtown housing project that began in the 50s. Similar in many ways to the Swedish Million Dwelling Program, the Newtown project entailed a huge commitment, sorry, a huge commitment to <coughs> residential building. The Apollo Pavilion, a mix of brutalist pavilion, bridge, and sculpture, has long been vandalized and despised. But a few years ago, a campaign managed by a hair's breadth to save it from being raised. It has now been restored and is enjoyed by many inhabitants of Kitchen. In the version by Elo Solegishvind, the pavilion is moved from its original context, redone and placed in another context. While containing its British history, it also acquires a more speculative form that reveals what the pavilion could be in another time and place. <coughs> the whole project reflects Ellison's interest in recent art history. And as is so often the case with Gishwind, he drew inspiration from science fiction films and computer games in making video projections on the pavilion's exterior. Is it a UFO, a space rocket, or perhaps a ruin from the future? It attests to parallel stories and the undiscovered possibilities of a building once considered hopeless. Time Space Shuttle was uh, commissioned for Tensa Museum, Reports from New Sweden, which was an exhibition about history and memory in Stockholm's district of Tensta, both in relation to the place and to people who live and work there. <coughs> As an exhibition, it took place at Tensta Kongshall from October 2013 to May 2014, but it had a life before that and an afterlife too, which actually still continues. In the exhibition, and here you see um, an installation shot. Some 40 artists, architects, local associations, performers, sociologists, cultural geographers, philosophers, and others address the past through artworks, research projects, seminars, 
symposia, guided walks, etc. Through these means, they also reported on the conditions of tents that today, particularly as a concrete image of what can be described as the new Sweden. A Sweden that must be understood quite differently from how it was several decades ago. New Sweden is home to people with vastly different backgrounds, and it is a place where economic and social distinctions are intensifying. According to a report by the OECD uh, around the time of, of the opening of the show, of all the OECD's 34 member states, income gaps in Sweden uh, were then increasing the most rapidly to the years <coughs> And in light of this, it is worth noting that some of the participants who contributed to Tansi Museum used their works to also look ahead and propose future scenarios. Uh, the exhibition was divided into two parts, um, the fall department and eventually this, which looked like this from one angle of the space. And uh, it um, mutated into the spring department and some works remained, like the uh, Time Space Shuttle, Apollo Pavilion. Other works uh, were um, uh, exchanged. So, Tensa is an unusually multifaceted phase, I would say. Its uh, most tangible feature is a large late modernist housing area built between 1967 and 72 as part of this million dwelling program, which meant that during a 10 year period, one million housing units were built across the country, um, sometimes in city centers, uh, but often also as suburbs like Tensta. And it was a giant leap in terms of housing conditions in Sweden. Before the million dwelling program, it was common to live in the city center of Stockholm uh, without having your own uh, bathroom. Uh, it could be an outhouse uh, in the courtyard, or it could be something in the basement. But through the million dwelling program, in one go, this uh, improved uh, radically. Nearly 6,000 dwellings in Tensta share space with Iron Age uh, graves, rune stones, a 12th century church, one of the oldest, if not the oldest building in the region of Soho. Um, with a famous Baroque chapel, and also a former military training area from the early 20th century that is now a protected nature reserve. Around, and this is what it looked like uh, before 1967, largely. Around 19,000 people live in Tesla today, roughly 90% of whom have a transnational background, many from the Middle East and North Africa. So this means that collective memory of Tensa is fragmented. It also means that tensions and conflicts erupt over historical and heritage related issues. Tensa Museum also touched upon the concept of cultural heritage and the complicated matter of how it is used in Sweden and elsewhere in Europe today. Because just as the struggle for collective memory can be liberating, it can also exclude certain people and even, as we've seen in certain parts of the world, lead to war. So a preoccupation with the past is fundamentally ambivalent. Yet, it is impossible to deny the close bonds between a new respect for history, both real and imaginary, and the sense of belonging, collective consciousness and identity promised by shared memory. With the concept of cultural heritage as a thematic point of departure, Tensei Museum examined what it actually means when the public debate concerning memory and history is replaced by a preoccupation with memory and heritage. So, just a few images from the neighborhood. Stockholm uh, is sometimes described as one of the most segregated cities uh, of Europe with a white and wealthy city center and a ring of, uh, um, of poor and colored suburbs uh, around it. So what, for instance, does it mean for extreme right-wing organizations and political parties, fascists in particular, to claim rights and interpretation over the idea of national heritage? The symposium, Cultural Heritage, a Treasure That Is Seeking Its Value, addressed this question, and this is an image from that. 
It took place at the Consul in March 2013 and was produced through collaboration with the Stockholm City Museum, uh, curated by the philosopher Boris Wooden, based in Zagreb and Berlin. And it involved a number of people who've been um, investigating and criticizing the notion of cultural heritage from different uh, points of view. So, Tensa Museum offered a rich array of events throughout the seven month period, allowing many fold interests and forms of expression to narrate the past, present, and future. In the process, Tensa Kongspal played the role of a museum in order to produce the authority necessary for discussing history, but also to indicate a desire for stability and continuity for the institution. It was actually a self-institutionalizing gesture that should be seen in light of the need for Tensa Kongspal, an underfunded private foundation established in 1998 to become more stable. We play the museum. Since its establishment, it has in fact Tensa Kongspal been run more like a project than an institution. In line with the neoliberal projectification of everything from social work and education to cultural activities that has been going on since the 1990s and which by now has created a pressing need for institutional continuity in general in the context of Sweden and I would argue in Northern Europe in general. So the Tensa Museum in the exhibition pattern points to far more than the institution where the exhibition was presented or to the housing estate. Tensa Museum is in many ways much more than an exhibition or even an institution. It has developed a sort of organism with a life of its own, absorbing artworks, artifacts, documentary photography, and other archival material. It has, among other things, become a place for doing research, for holding debates, and for discussing future scenarios, or just actually become a meeting place. So for example, starting in the spring of 2012, well in advance of the exhibition opening, we held seminars every other month with a dozen people who eventually contributed to the project. They addressed the history and memory of the location, as well as the notion of cultural heritage. Uh, Boris Wooden functioned as the project philosopher, as a fellow traveler, giving various kinds of input. All the seminar participants were then invited to make new work or add new research to the exhibition. Um, so, uh, let's return now, let's see where we are. Here is the space of Tensa Costa. Um, it's a four uh, storage space underneath um, a very modest shopping mall, about 500 square meters. It's a private landlord, so about 20% of our annual budget uh, goes to uh, our rent, entity. So we're right underneath what we see in this image. Uh, so to return to, to the exhibition as such, the, back of the exhibition's backbone consisted of richly detailed paintings by Victor Jungstahl, anchored in his experiences of growing up in a violent quarter of a late modernist housing project in a small Swedish town in the south. Urban planning, the million dwelling program, and the place <coughs> have long been themes in Rostal's work, not as a physical expression of a vanquished dream, but as a place where things happen. Other references for uh, his art <coughs> Our music and the book The Coming Insurrection, first published uh, in French by the Invisible Committee in 2007, which talks about a new feeling of community. Uh, the book, which emanates from the French counterpart of the kind of housing area that Rostal depicts, takes into account recurring social uprisings that only occasionally reach international news. Rostal's paintings are examples of an under-discussed genre within contemporary art, namely works dealing with late modernist housing estates, and that became a red thread throughout Tanzania. This is a future scenario when nature has taken over, um, plants coming very close to the buildings, and there's even a waterfall coming out of one of the windows. Another example is um, uh, Marva Arsanios project, Arthodoxia, the social housing project, 
um, a very ambitious uh, social housing project for Beirut from the late 50s, which was never realized, but which she sort of wants to revive by uh, making uh, small models as sculptures. And we have Terence Gower, uh, who has been looking at Catalogona, this giant late modernist housing estate in the city center of Mexico City. Uh, also, uh, the famous site of, of the military uh, killing of uh, many students in 1968, right before the Games. And Dominique Gonzalez Ferster, who in many works have engaged with this type of architecture. Uh, so, this genre, let me just say that this image, <coughs> was present in Tulsa Museum uh, through a mini exhibition. Um, and uh, it confirmed the great interest artists have shown in the subject of late modernist housing since the 90s, which was important for the exhibition. Pensa is not alone. The situation with late modernist housing uh, we know from most parts of the world, and there are also artists from most parts of the world being interested in this. And they tend to give a more interesting, complex view of these areas than, let's say, mainstream media or even politicians. Um, and interestingly enough, one of, of them, uh, Nino Kim, uh, showed a video called New Town Ghosts, thinking about the topic of this uh, symposium. Uh, but the new towns in Korea tend to be from the 90s and later, after the end of the military dictatorship. <coughs> and as part of Tanzania Museum, public tours were given of a real late modernist dwelling, a so-called <coughs> model apartment in Tansa, situated in an ordinary block of uh, flats. It's now a branch of the City Museum of Stockholm. Uh, the tour entailed traveling back in time to late 1960s Tansa. The apartment is actually a reconstruction of the first family who moved in there in 1969. So some of the furniture has been retrieved from, from that family. And we all, there were also um, numerous uh, tours uh, to do with the architecture um, as part of the uh, exhibition. And the current situation in neighborhoods like Tensta, more precisely Busby, which is located a few kilometers away, was presented through the film Incandescence. The film is a reflection on the experiences that young people from Busby have of the mass media coverage of their area of discriminatory situations in school and of everyday life. Based on interviews that the artist Beza Pustrani-Muri and the ethnologist René Leon Rosales conducted during the summer of 2013 with young people engaged in <coughs> Megafonen, um, a network of young activists, the film tells about an organization that works for social justice in stigmatized and economically deprived neighborhoods. And a network should be said that has been actually rather uh, painted black by uh, mainstream media in Sweden. And as a counterpart to that, contemporary uh, report was a film from 1988, uh, focusing on one class in the senior high school of Tensta, uh, a film made before the big changes in Europe with the fall of the Berlin Wall where um, about 20% of the students in any class of that school would have a trans local background, whereas today, uh, 90, 95, sometimes 100% uh, is the case. <coughs> so since this senior high school uh, is an important institution in Tensa, and one which stands for relative continuity in a volatile neighborhood, it became uh, a recurring reference point in Tansa Museum. Um, the school opened in 1984, which meant that its 30th anniversary happened during the exhibition period. So we borrowed four artworks from their really interesting art collection, with works from the late 19th century until today. And, uh, also hosted a couple of events uh, to do with the history of the school. As a footnote, the second image from the left is made by uh, Carl Larson. It's a sketch for a mural. Carl Larson happens to be the most known artist in Sweden of all times. 
So to be able to borrow that from a local school was quite um, a pleasure, I have to say. There were uh, many other um, contributions as well. Alongside all the new artworks, uh, for example, uh, satirical drawings by the exiled artist Amin Amin, uh, which addressed the political situation in Somalia. Uh, printed out from Amir's website, which is popular within Somalia, and amongst people in the diaspora, these were displayed on a bulletin board and became the starting point for a series of afternoon events co-organized with the Somali Association, uh, the major organization for one of Tensta's largest uh, groups. Uh, the topic for one event was representations of Somalia, um, which is something um, that often leaves uh, a lot to be uh, wished for. And alongside the these drawings, we showed uh, material from the Kurdish Association, um, which is one of the oldest cultural associations in the neighborhood and one which has engaged a lot with cultural activities, poetry, music, and a little bit uh, visual arts. And again, that led to uh, collaborations on a series of events with uh, the Kurdish Association taking place at uh, the uh, art center. Another archival presentation was to do with the architecture. Um, a private collection, architect Eric Stenberg, who has lived in Tansa for 10 years and who is somewhat a specialist on the Million Dwelling Program, generously lent his material and was also the one conducting the architecture course. We um, also were able to uh, do commissions. The politics of listening. Um, became the theme of a long-term collaborative project carried out by the artist Petra Bauer uh, with a social scientist and the trans-ethnic association Tensa Yusta Women's Center. Uh, it was uh, presented as an installation and a series of acts or seminars. Here, questions concerning housing and housing conditions were central and also the politics of listening. What if we focus more on practicing listening than on underlining uh, the need to give voice to, to something? <coughs> but the housing um, situation came back as a red thread. In many projects, I'm going to skip to this one, um, and maybe most uh, charmingly so, through 10 19th century watercolors by Elisabeth Hörbei on loan from the City Museum of Stockholm. Um, a rare case of classical Stockholmiana um, traveling from the city center to the suburbs. This lady uh, never married, which meant that she could not afford her own house in the middle of the 19th century. So she moved from one rental room to another in uh, a part of town which was dead the home to the migrants, uh, the poor, the, the lowest of the working class, uh, which now, surprise, surprise, is the home to the creative class. So to show her amazing watercolors documenting these different rooms was also a way of talking about how these areas, of course, change and uh, their locations uh, shift, but we still have a situation which is very similar to Sudan, where she lived during her days, uh, but in Tansa today. So a bit conscious of time, um, so I'm just going to uh, flick through some images to make you um, understand what a multifaceted uh, exhibition this became with artworks, with uh, archival photographs with collaborations with a very traditional uh, heritage association, um, commissioned uh, radio programs on the future of Tensa, um, commissioned uh, poetry by a slam poetry group called uh, Revolution Poetry, which I think stands for some of the most interesting cultural production of the suburbs of Stockholm today. Uh, the Silent University by artist Ahmed Burgut, uh, in the exhibition space, but eventually developing into one of the most important things that we do today at Tansa Kosta, namely the language cafe. I'll show you that in a moment. I'd love to tell people about this. 
because we were playing museum. And if you're a museum, of course, today you have to have branches. So we asked two prestigious museums in the city centre if we could open Chelsea Museum branches with them. And they said yes. So uh, for uh, eight months, we had one Tesla Museum branch in the City Museum and another one uh, at the Museum of Medieval Stockholm, each uh, giving space for a new commission uh, by an artist. This is Bert Krauss, um, who is not unfamiliar to some people in the room. Um, and we also managed to, to make a commission to a young artist slash curator who did uh, a new version of an old um, format, which is Hypertakes, where you can borrow artworks the way you can borrow books in a library. Um, and the first iteration took place in the local library in Tesla, uh, based on uh, commissions. And as we were working intensively on Tesla Museum, the uh, local library called and said, we're going to be renovated. We need a space for a small branch. Can we open one over at the console? Of course, we said yes. So we ended up having this tiny corner. And similarly, we were called out by a group of people who have been engaged in the very dire housing situation today in Sweden. It's hard to believe, but housing is a big problem in Sweden. And for the first time, a group of uh, people representing different organizations and network came together to do the first national forum on housing. So they asked if they could do it at the Konstab because they had heard about the art center, uh, about the Museum and its engagement with um, mm -hmm. housing. So let me just now move on a little bit. Um, because I want to talk about how the uh, Cancer Museum, in a way, has exemplified and um, maybe gelled in a special way how we try to work with the art center uh, in, in the neighborhood, which is uh, very much to do with uh, thinking about shared concerns between artworks, um, artists, um, the institution, and um, visitors, whether they live in Hanska or not. Um, but also in terms of uh, contact and conflict zones. So the anthropologist Mary Louise Pratt uses uh, the term contact zone to describe social spaces where various cultures collide and try to deal with each other, often through asymmetrical relations of power. The context that Pratt refers to tend to involve colonialism and slavery and their repercussions. She employs the term to reconsider the prevalent models of community which feature in both academic and social work. And seen as a contact zone, Pilsen Museum includes a certain amount of auto-ethnographic material, in other words, texts, images, and other documents in which people describe themselves. In this material, they also deal with the representations that others make of them, as well as with material produced by people who do not live and work in Kansa. This is a form of transculturation, again, Marie Lee's past term, whereby subordinate groups engage with material from a dominant group, replacing reductive concepts of assimilation that are common characterizations of colonial culture. I think that many projects within Tansi Museum testify to the fact that subordinate groups cannot usually control what comes out of the dominant culture, but it's possible and usual to determine what gets absorbed and how. And again, James Clifford, the anthropologist, he also describes uh, contact zones as uh, places of hybrid possibility and political negotiation, sites of exclusion and struggle. And of course, any contact zone has to be a conflict zone as well. And this has been interestingly elaborated by the Vienna-based curator and writer, uh, Nora Sternfeld, who is a professor of curating in Helsinki at the moment. So, I just want to round off with one image, which I'm going to come to. Okay. So Tesla Museum reports from Sweden officially closed in May 2014. But we couldn't stop. 
so much material surface, so many new contracts were established. So until today, and probably for years to come, there's always something to do with Tensa Museum going on at the Art Center. We do straightforward exhibitions. Um, we do uh, commissions. We do things that a more uh, conventional art center would do. Uh, but there's always uh, a Tensa Museum thing uh, which is extremely interesting in relation to how we build relationships uh, with the neighborhood. So, and also, what is happening is that the debates, negotiations, and struggles of the questions such as whose history is at stake here, how about the present, and what kind of future do we want to create, are very much alive. I would say that the organism called the Tesla Museum is kicking, and the contact and conflict zones are really alive. Time Space Shuttle Apollo Pavilion and the projection with words set in black and white against a bright pink background testify to the fact that things can be different. And they surely will be. Today, the once hated and dilapidated Apollo Pavilion is renovated and it's actually declared an official English heritage site. And the Six Pistols, of course, the quintessential subcultural phenomenon whose first album cover uh, was exactly pink, like this, um, with black and white words, has been recommended to also become official English heritage. Thank you. Question first, because depending on your answer, I have a different follow-up. 
Is entry to the museum free? Yes. Okay. And, but it wasn't when I came. Right. So I, that was something I said to the board in the interview. It has to be free. And interestingly, we have introduced the US model of uh, voluntary donations. So what happens is that we get approximately the same amount from voluntary donations as they used to get for tickets. Not a huge amount, but... Well, that, that's fantastic because my, my question therefore is, in terms of your concept of the contact zone, it seems to me that free museums are a place where, just like public libraries, people can walk in without an appointment, they don't have to know anybody in they can just walk in. So how does your attendance figures reflect the community that you're based in? In other words, is it, is it a, would you say it's reflective in its entirety of your local population? Yeah. Is it, yeah. Yes, it is. That's, a, that, that's an important um, comment slash question. So we have now between 25 and 30,000 visitors per year, um, and uh, they the, the, I'm using my words. Okay, I'm at 4.30. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, there are different groups. So one group are um, the art professionals. Many of them come to a lot of things that we do. Seminars, because we have a rich program of, of uh, lectures and seminars and screenings, etc. Um, then you have the people who are interested in culture in general. They tend to be slightly older, and we see an immediate increase of this group if we are on um, television or covered by the mainstream newspapers, cultural pages. Uh, then they come directly, the day after. Um, and a third category are people living and working in Canada. They do not necessarily come to see a show, to really take this down. Now, depending on that. <laughs> Uh, Christian did an internship with us last year. Uh, so the um, the uh, this group they tend to uh, come because of there being a meeting, or they're coming with their school class, or their organization, or their um, workplace. Um, and increasingly, after Tunsil Museum, uh, groups contact us asking if they can use our space for their own activities. And most of the time, we say yes. So this ranges from uh, save the children's parents meetings uh, once a month to weekly homework assistance run by uh, an independent uh, organization. They used to do it in the library, and then they need more space, so they asked us and we said yes. To a small group of uh, people 70 plus who like to write, they live in the neighborhood and they want to share their writing with each other. So they come and, and read and, and discuss each other's writing. Um, and then the language happens which is an outgrowth continuation of Ahmed Erdogan's Silent University, an art project whose purpose it is to allow people with uh, no papers um, to exercise their expertise through seminars, lectures, etc. In Tamsta, it's primarily manifest through this uh, language cafe where people come to practice Swedish and Arabic, primarily, with uh, volunteers. We began once a week on Sundays, but it is so popular that we had to expand it, so now it's twice uh, a week. And uh, between 20 and 30 people come uh, each time. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, first of all, maybe I should say that I saw the spring department, which had a really huge impact <laughs> uh, on my practice as a curator. And um, yeah, maybe first my first question would be about how did you feel after the cultural image symposium three months after you had the the, the riots uh, happened uh, in Stockholm? I was to, to know the impact which uh, that had. Um, and the other question was maybe more um, to know if you asked yourself that the question about how to talk about that project without uh, falling in some kind of objectivization, I would say, like talking about all that, because a lot of things happened. When I remember when I came to the space, I actually met a lot of people. And like uh, to talk about that project, of course, to like anchor it, you need to talk about 
the objects we are going to show. So I wanted to know a little bit more about that. About the objects? About, like, if you ask yourself a question uh, to talk about that object without talking about the objects. No, okay. I'll, I'll start with the, the end. Um, I, that's why I, I take some time talking about what was actually in the show. I, I don't think it makes any sense to, to, to talk about it on, on a theoretical uh, or abstract level only. It is relying on um, a very performative project, which is hands-on, extremely hands-on. Sometimes I, I, I begin my presentation by saying, this is a report from the workshop floor, in a way. Uh, it's very much about what literally goes on with these artworks, with this archival material, with the groups coming in, with um, the meetings happening, um, for example. Uh, then the riots, um, which maybe we could call uprisings. That was in 2013, in the spring of 2013. It started, uh, as so often is the case, where, by the police killing someone. In this case, uh, an elderly man who appeared on his own balcony with a machete, and somebody called the police and said that his wife was threatened. The police came. Um, <coughs> the couple said, don't worry, everything is calm. They didn't want to open the door, but they tried to convince the police that uh, they didn't have to, to bother too much. But the police decided just to get go into the apartment, and it ended up with him the man with the machete being killed. Then the police uh, claimed that he uh, died at the hospital, but somebody took a photograph of the corpse in a corpse bag right outside the house. And this was the trigger, which meant that uh, primarily young people uh, became very upset. So you had the usual scenario with uh, fires and cars and throwing stones, etc. And it uh, extended to other suburbs of Stockholm, a little bit in terms as well, and to other cities of Sweden. I think this was an awakening for many people because uh, there is a common belief that Sweden is so calm and there are no conflicts and tensions and so on, which is of course not true at all. Um, and I think it has meant uh, an important radicalization of younger generations uh, from the suburbs, or with strong connections to the suburbs. Um, we uh, don't maybe have uh, direct repercussions today, but indirect ones. Um, the violence is continuing. Uh, last week, um, a young man was cold-bloodedly murdered in broad daylight in Kansas. Somebody came on a moped and shot him in his head. Um, and things happen every now and then. So it's not um, devoid of those uh, eruptions of, of violence that you read about in the newspapers, but that is just one side of, of this multifaceted phase. I think this is our final question. Thanks. Um, yeah, two questions were maybe related. Um, um, I'm always really impressed. I've been a visitor to this amazing space. I'm always really impressed by like the amount of stuff that you do, um, and I wondered how you manage ideas around sustainability. And when you take on a project, you say yes to so many things. How do you negotiate on a practical level and a theoretical level the involvement of so many different groups and different needs and desires and and temporalities? And then maybe link to that is, is an idea around how do you negotiate your relationship to what? What I would consider services that the state should offer, like a library. Say that again. How, how do you negotiate your relationship to, to, to services I would suggest something like the state would offer, like language? Like, oh. like, uh, like, uh, <laughs> like uh, that kind of thing. And, and maybe it's been related, I'm not sure, but I wonder if you could talk to those who concerned about sustainability mm -hmm. and about the state. Thanks. So, some basic information it's a private foundation founded in 1998 by an artist living locally and his friends. So it's actually a grassroots initiative. 50% of our budget comes from public sources, the state, the municipality, and the region. The rest we have to generate ourselves. It's a big challenge for the structural economy in Sweden. It has been based on public funding entirely up until 15 years ago. So there are actually very, very few other sources. But we manage through European collaborations, uh, EU money, and um, 
other things. So the team is tiny, six people including myself, but the team is amazing. And everybody's really engaged. And as the director, I have to pay close attention to people not working too much, uh, not uh, being exploited in, in our post this neoliberal uh, working uh, situation. Um, the reason why we can do so relatively many things is that we collaborate. So it's not only dependent on us. There's often also somebody else who is uh, baking the pie with us. So I think that's maybe the, the secret in a way. Um, and uh, the, the other um, part of the question, services. I think we are similar, but we're also really different. We're similar, as you said before, because like the library, uh, it doesn't cost anything. Um, nothing that we do costs anything, actually. Seminars, screenings, courses, whatever. Um, but it's different because we are art-centric. It begins and ends with art. And I'm adamant about that I only want to work with the best art that I know. I'm not going to compromise thinking of oh, what do these people want to see or what does that group desire in terms of art. Um, it has to be what, what myself and the team think are the most urgent, relevant, and best uh, projects and artists around. And that's sort of the, the source of <laughs> energy or whatever you could call it. And everything else relates to that somehow. And because, of course, contemporary art is so multifaceted because contemporary art includes everything else today, it's not difficult to find these uh, shared concerns, these uh, uh, seeds for contact with public surfaces. So uh, although some people say, oh, you look like a community center, well, maybe we do, but art is our main focus. So I can take um, a lot of pleasure from the fact that you know, a very sophisticated and what some people would call difficult artwork sits next to uh, homework assistants. So the kids and teenagers, they are really um, in close proximity to things that I think in the long run actually uh, do affect people. So, I will just say one more thing. <laughs> That's a sign. Um, if I imagine um, good feedback, important feedback, um, I, I feel that if in 10 or 20 years' time a young person would come up to me and say that I had my first really important, strong experience of contemporary art at Tensei Hostel, mm -hmm. then that's the best assessment I think you can get. 